So this evening's event, tonight's event is titled Jews Who Saved Jews, uh, the story and legacy of Rebecca and Joseph Bau and their connection to Oskar Schindler. Um, uh, this will be a presentation uh, of this extraordinary story by the daughters of Rebecca and Joseph Bau, uh, Slila Bau, Cohen and Hadassah Bau. Slila Bau Cohen is a lecturer and performer and manager of the museum, uh, Joseph Bau House, or uh, the Joseph Bau Museum. Um, Hadassah Bau is an actress, a singer, a songwriter, a lecturer, an artist, a graphic artist, and manager as well of the Joseph Bau House Museum. And tonight they will be sharing the story of their parents, the story of love and bravery in the Holocaust and um, in Israel. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about this, this relatively unknown story. And also there will be an opportunity for us to engage with them in a question and answer session towards the end. Um, this event is hosted by the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in partnership with the Joseph Bau Museum, Telfed, Witz University Alumni Relations and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. At this point in time, I would like to invite Dr. Les Glassman, who is representing the Witz University Alumni Relations, to begin the event by just sharing a few words with us. And then after Dr. Glassman has, has shared his remarks with us, he will then hand over to Tali Nate, who is the director and founder of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. So uh, Dr. Glassman, over to you. Okay, thank you so very much. It gives me a great honor and a privilege, really, to, to welcome you all this evening to this very special, unique, and incredible event that you're going to be seeing. Um, I have a personal connection with Slila and Adassa and the Bau Museum, but tonight's event has been hosted um, by the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And, um, and in partnership with um, Telfed, which is the South African Zionist Federation in Israel, and the Bits University alumni also here in Israel. And um, I just want to thank everybody for making the time and effort to, to be here this evening. You won't be disappointed. Slida and Adassa are just absolutely delightful. Their story is incredible. And we so look forward in great anticipation. And I'd like to hand over to a very special person, to Tali Natas, who I've known for many years, and Tali is my family. And Tali was the founder of the Holocaust um, genocide, uh, the Holocaust, uh, Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in Johannesburg. And those who are in South Africa, it's, it's a must visit. It really is, just as the Joseph Bau Museum is a must visit in Israel. So without any further ado, Tali, and I just want to mention, which Tali will mention, is that Tali has a personal connection to this evening in many ways, but the most important way is that Tali's father was one of the Schindler's List. So really, Tali, thank you so much to you and your team for making this evening a reality. We really thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for initiating this. Uh, and welcome everyone uh, to this very special event tonight. And we are honored to have with us Holocaust survivors, to ha have with us teachers, uh, and friends, friends from South Africa, friends from around the world. Uh, so lovely to see familiar faces, uh, people that are that spoke at, at our uh, institute. I see Lady Hatta that we had the pleasure to host. We, I see many, many of you that uh, were with us um, physically and now joining us on Zoom. I do not want to take much of your time because it is such a pleasure to have Tzlila and Hadassah Bau sharing with us a unique story because we always speak about the righteous amongst the nations. We all know of Oskar Schindler that of course saved the lives of 1,200 men, women and children, including Joseph and Rebecca Bau, but including my father, Moses Turner, and my uncle, Henrik Turner that we're also all on Schindler's list. But how many of us know about Jews who saved Jews? And I think Slila and Adassa are going to share with us a unique look at 
how her, their parents not only were Holocaust survivors, not only knew Oskar Schindler personally and owed their life in the end to Oskar Schindler, but also saved many lives um, whenever they could. Also, just finally, it is a pleasure to work with another museum, a sister museum in uh, Israel. And uh, we are looking very much forward, Slila and Adassa, to learn from you about yourself, about your parents, and of course, about your important work in the museum. So Tzlila and Adassa, the Zoom floor is yours. <laughs> Hi. Hi, we are so excited to be with you today, really. This is so beautiful. And thank you, thank you that you are here with us. And really, we will tell you unbelievable story about our parents that they told us, told us many, many things, but they didn't tell us how they saved Jews. So modest people, unbelievable. Our father was artist graphic. He was painter. He was uh, in animation. He was the pioneer. Uh, he was writer, poet, publisher, advertisement, and uh, the best father in the world, the best husband in the world, but everything, all his art, multi-multi-talented, is the sense of humor. In everything, always, he found the humor, and even in his book about the Holocaust that he published, you will see the name of the book and everything. And uh, is with sense of humor, in dark sense of humor, but with humor. And uh, so we begin now to tell you, we are now, we talk to you in our museum. So this is our father, Joseph Bau, our mom, Rebecca Bau. Uh, Tzlila, she is the baby, and I am the biggest daughter. And uh, he, our father loved to take photos, uh, like can be many times that he did special day to photo us. This was amazing. Everything with so much love was unbelievable. Uh, and our father, when he came to Israel, he didn't know Hebrew, and uh, <clears throat> he began here to study Hebrew alone, and he is one of the biggest in Israel that he created the Hebrew fonts. He was uh, really unbelievable also in Latin uh, fonts and in Hebrew fonts. He created hundreds of fonts. And here are the fonts for the Israeli movies. He did all the spatial lettering for them. Here for uh, Geva Studios also. If you remember the, I don't know, some of you, there used to be a, a two um, studios for movies in Israel. It was Geva and Erzelia. And he did uh, the logo for the, both of the studios. So this is, it's called Hadashot Geva. It used to show the news in the theater. This he did also. Here, this is his painting, the creation, like the beginning when he came to Israel. And also in uh, all, the all the places in the Holocaust, he began from the beginning, Bereshit. So this, he, he paint himself like a sculpture that he built himself all the years, all the life from the beginning. And here is the studio, the museum. Actually, the museum is uh, our father's studio. And all the studio is big, big miracle. 
a lot of miracles, how he create everything he built by himself without money, unbelievable things. And here there are a few of his books, Lotov, Brit Milash, Notarzach. And here is also in the museum, some of his things about the Hebrew language. We are one museum in the world about the Hebrew language when with our father paintings. And he published book, Brit Mila, like friendship with the Hebrew words. And, and this is like in the second room, uh, you see uh, also some of the fonts that he created. And he was the first animator in Israel and he built the, all the equipment by himself and uh, from parts that he found on the street. Like here you see like an X-ray uh, leg from an X-ray machine and he built this arm and he put here the cameras, everything he made by himself. These were the cameras and, but like, unfortunately there was a robbery here and they were stolen. Someone asked about it. And, um, and, he, and he, all the animations that was in Israel from the beginning, like from the 50s and 60s, so everything our father made. After he made the animation movies, he said, where will I show it? And then he decided to build a movie theater and uh, one second, uh, this is the movie projector. movie projector that he also built from parts in the washroom. <laughs> in the washroom, yeah. And this in the kitchen. kitchen, he turned it into a dark room where he developed everything. And uh, and this is the screen where he showed all his movies. And the, all the directors used to come here. And this was the center for the for the directors and for the actors, they used to come here and they watch uh, the movies. And now we have- I've lost- Pardon? I've lost the screen. I can't see you, but I can't see you. I, I don't understand what? We will help you. you. You continue. We will help you. Okay. Uh, uh, our father in Poland, after the war, he worked in four newspapers and he did caricature and uh, he signed Big Bow, B-A-U, Big Bow. He came to Israel. He didn't sign anything in all his works. And our mom was so mad. Why you don't sign? Oh, mom, who need my name? But he saw that she so mad that uh, he makes things like that. So he said, you know what? I will sign something, but you will be the one in the world that you will know. And uh, this will be our sign to love. This will be our sign to happiness. And that's what he signed. What does it look like to you? Ah, you can't ask, we, uh, we can't hear your answers. But usually we ask, what do you think it is? And many people say it looks like a swan. It looks like in and yang. Everyone sees something, but look, something very interesting. When you turn it on its side, in Hebrew, it says bow, like B, like bet in Hebrew, B, Aleph, and Vav, bow. But he put it like this, and no one actually knew who is doing all those works of art that were in the movie theater and other places. He was unknown, completely unknown. And we knew what it meant, but we never knew why and we never asked. We said always he's very modest, so he doesn't sign his name clear. Right. And only two years after he passed away, we found out. Uh, his exhibition about the Hebrew language was in the Knesset. And uh, Shimon Peres was there, and Ruby Rivlin, who was our last uh, president, and other Knesset members. And they were talking about our father. And Adassa and I are sitting there, and like I go, I said to her, Tell me, where do they know him from? Like, no one knows him, and they talk about him in the Knesset. And someone got up and said, I'll tell you something, even the daughters don't know. 
Joseph Bau was the main graphic artist of the Mossad, and we had no idea. He forged documents, among other things he did, for uh, the spies, for Ellie Cohen, and also for uh, to catch when they went to catch Eichmann in Argentina, and for the whole team that went to catch him. And we had no idea, nothing. There were signs along the way, but only now we understand them. Now, uh, if I tell you that our father worked for the Mossad and he was a forger, so I have to go and tell you about his history. So everything I tell you is from the book that you wrote in Hebrew, it's called Shnot Tartzach. In English, it's called Dear God, Have You Ever Gone Hungry? And uh, the book was translated to many languages, to Chinese, uh, to Spanish, to Polish, to Dutch, to Russian, even to Arabic. And, uh, and, and, and he wrote everything what he went through. And also the paintings are there that he painted inside the, uh, the Holocaust. Now, our father was born in 1920 in Krakow in Poland. In September 1938, he started studying art in University of uh, Art in Krakow. By the end of the year, the professor who was teaching them calligraphy came into the class and said like that, today I have to teach you something not important. If someone doesn't want, doesn't have to. And what did he teach them? He taught them Gothic letters. Now, when the students heard that they don't need to, everyone got up and left. And our father said, I don't know why I fell in love with those letters and I learned them day and night. Then the summer vacation came, September 1st, 1939, the war broke out and he couldn't go back to university. When they took him and his family to get to Krakow, he took with him a few things. Uh, first of all, he took with him the drafting table, which his parents bought him for school. And the other thing he took with him was the briefcase that his parents bought him like an, for the artistic uh, uh, school. And, where he kept his calligraphy pens and his uh, inks and uh, and paints, you know, and everything. But he did something that till today we don't understand. He made, under the tools, he made a double bottom and there he hid pictures of his family. How did he know where they will take him? And for how long? And, and we were, we till today, we don't understand because we have, the, everyone was murdered and we have the pictures. And uh, later he, he hid their uh, poems that he wrote and the, and the paintings and, and, and you'll see. So they take them to the ghetto, ghetto Krakow, and the Germans are looking for someone who knows to write in Gothic letters. And our father is the only one. So the art saved his life. So he worked for the Jewish, uh, for the German police, for the Jewish police, and for the Jewish underground. And he forged documents and saved thousands of people that they managed to escape. And one day they came to him from the underground and said the Yuzek, Yuzek is uh, Joseph in Polish. You saved so many people, why don't you save yourself? So he looked at them like this as if he doesn't even understand that, what they said to him. And he said, tell me, but if I escape, who will save the others? And he stayed till the last day. He could escape and didn't. From the... Uh, and here is the map of the ghetto that he drew there. And from the ghetto, 
they transfer them to Plashow concentration camp. If uh, anyone, if you saw the movie Schindler's List, it was taken place in a Plashow concentration camp. And this is the painting that our father drew there. And uh, he worked in the main office of the commandant and, uh, and there he was drawing. Try to imagine him doing all those works of graphic, uh, drawing the map and underneath he keeps on doing forging documents, saving Jews, uh, writing poems, paintings and doing other things we don't understand till today from where, where he had the strength and the courage to do it. And while he was drawing this map, the commandant came to him and said, I want you to make a blueprint out of this map. Now in uh, English, uh, sorry, in Hebrew and in Polish, you don't call it blueprint, you call it sand print. The reason is that in those days to make a copy of, uh, of a plan, you had to do it with the help of the sun. Now today, when you want to make a, a copy, you put in the machine, you get the copy. But how did they do it in those days? You had to place the map on a wooden frame. Underneath, you put a special paper that was sensitive to sun rays, put it outside, the sun made the copy, and later, you had to develop it in uh, ammonia. Our father looked out the window and didn't see any sun. And with a lot of fear, he said, but there is no sun today. Today, I can't do it. Maybe tomorrow. What do I care about the sun? The commandant said, I want the, the copy now. And you have to know it's or a copy or a bullet in your head. So our father wrote in his book, he was a big specialist in murdering, but not in engineering, and I had to do it. So he put the drawing on the wooden frame, underneath he put the special paper, and he went outside and held it and waited for the sun. But the sun didn't come out, and he didn't know what to do. So he, he aimed it at the sky praying for the sun to come out. Sun, please come out even for one second. But the sun didn't come out. All of a sudden, a young, beautiful woman dressed in striped uniform, just like him, walked by, saw him standing like this, aiming at the sky, looked at him and said, excuse me, sir, do you need any help? Later, she told him that she thought he was signaling to American airplanes. And he looked at her and said, you know, I'm waiting for the sun, but the sun doesn't want to come out to me. Maybe you can substitute her place for me. And he aimed the frame at her. So she blushed, laughed and walked away. He said, oh, okay, the sun didn't come out. He's going to kill me, but I will try to develop it. What will happen will happen. He took down the paper put it in the developing chemical, and to his surprise, the copy came out. He said, wow, a miracle. So she was my son. And on the next day, he wanted to thank her, but he had nothing to thank her with. So he knew that in the edge of the camp, there are flowers growing in the, under the watchtower that under, uh, in the edge of the camp, there are flowers growing and he risked himself and he went there and he picked some flowers and she, he saw to what uh, office he, uh, she went and he walked there with the flowers, so happy. He brought her the flowers and the engineer was sitting there, saw him with flowers, he jumps and said, Yusek, you are not normal. Walking with the, in a concentration camp with flowers? The commandant is sitting next door. If he sees you with the flowers, he's going to kill you on the spot. Took the flowers from his hand, threw to the garbage, covered it with some papers and said, get out from here immediately. So our father left. A few days. <coughs> <coughs> 
sorry. Oh, I drank. <coughs> Few days later, in the line to receive the soup, suddenly he saw her. He came to her and said, you are my miracle. You saved my life. I uh, am alive because of you. The map came unbelievable. And they were so excited. <clears throat> they wanted to kiss. They wanted to hug. But men and women cannot, couldn't um, uh, touch each other. And she said to him, you know, after the commandant left, the engineer looked out in the garbage, found the wilted flowers already, gave them to me and said, you have to know that Yusek Bao brought it to you as thank you and listen to me. You must meet him, he's a very good man. So they decided to meet in a secret place. And our father wrote in his book like this, while we were courting, I wanted to bring her something. What could I bring her? Nothing. I knew that she loved that her uh, shoes were shiny, we have any shoes. So I got an idea. When I came to her, I spat on her shoe and with the sleeve, like he put the sleeve like this, I went like this on the shoe, like I, uh, and then the shoes were shiny and she was uh, happy for a few minutes and I was happy. After a few days, he said to her, do you know what, let's get married. So she looked at him and said, oh, now I know you are crazy. Who is getting married in a concentration camp? Tell me, he said to her, who promises us that tomorrow we are going to be alive? You are right. And they decided to get married. So father did it, <clears throat> his daily bread for a few days. And for that, he bought from someone a silver teaspoon. And then again, he didn't eat his daily bread for a few days and gave the silver teaspoon to a jeweler who in a secret place made from it two wedding bands. Those wedding, and look what he did for love. And he just, they just knew each other for such a short time and he didn't eat. The wedding bands he gave to his mom, who was together with his, with his bride in the women's camp. Uh, if you see here that I'm putting my arm, um, the cursor, here was the women's camp on this hill, in this triangle. And the day they decided to get married, exactly on the day the Germans took the women to work hard labor outside the camp. They returned late, late at night. They came from the gate that was here. They walked like that here when, and to get into the women's camp, they had to cross between the men's barracks that were here and the Germans turned off all the lights and they had to uh, cross in darkness like this and go to the women's camp. Now the women who came back alive, not all of them, came back alive, some they, the Germans killed already, and they wanted to let the men know I'm alive. So they had a way of letting them know. And the way was, usually when we lecture at schools and we ask, you know, so we ask, uh, how do you think they, they could let them know? So they tell us, uh, some of them say, SMS, WhatsApp, <laughs> they live in a different world. So what they used to do, they used to whistle. So the young bride whistled. And our father answered her. And she whistled and he answered. And she whistled and he answered. 
till he found her in the dark. In his pocket, he had a white kerchief, just like the women put on his head, stood between his mom and his bride, and like this, quietly, they smuggled him into the women's camp. They came to her barrack. He put the ring on her finger. He said, like in a Jewish wedding, put on himself, and this was the wedding. If you remember, and if you watch the movie Shinda's List, they show there a couple getting married. Those are, those are our parents. It's the story about them. Now the story goes on and on. Our father had to escape, but uh, uh, you have to come and visit our museum and hear the rest. <laughs> and so uh, now, if you remember, they show in the movie also a woman who is giving manicure to, to the commandant. So this was our mom. She wanted to become a doctor, and, but uh, she, Jews weren't allowed to go to university, so she couldn't study medicine. So she learned to be a nurse. She learned to be a beautician, a cosmetician. She knew how to do manicure, pedicure. And she herself saved many, many people by uh, also doing pedicure to them. And they, uh, so they didn't limp. So this way the Germans didn't kill them. And also the commandant, Amon Get heard that she's a very good, uh, she knows how to do manicure and pedicure. And after she worked all day, very hard work, he forced her, she didn't want, she was scared to give him manicure. So she at night used to come to his house and uh, she was petrified, but she had no choice. And what did he do? He placed a gun under her elbow. And one day she asked him, why is the gun? And he said to her, if you just scratch me, I'm going to kill you on the spot. Imagine under how much fear she was, but she did it. Now she knew nine languages and she knew German too. And uh, she understood what he was planning, who is going to kill, who is going to burn, who is going to hang. And on, when she returned to her barrack, the women were already waiting for her and she was telling them all the information. And he started suspecting because many people he wanted to kill all of a sudden weren't there where he thought they will be. And he came to the conclusion that it's only Rebecca who is transferring all the news. And he punished her in a horrible, horrible way. She was a very sick woman all her life. And uh, do you think she stopped saving? She kept on saving always. And uh, one day she heard that uh, they're making a list of people who are going to Schindler's list to uh, Czechoslovakia. So she came to, uh, she went to one of the men who made the list and she said, listen, you owe me because I saved your mother. And he said, you are right. She told me, and he put our mom's name on the list. And our mom said to him like this, listen, yeah. I Hello? know I will solve it. I didn't use any of the numbers. I hope I'm not using uh, internet thing though. Dasa. I, I hear someone. It's okay, you can continue. There ah. was a problem. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I'll just uh, repeat what I said there. She said to him, uh, you owe me because I saved your mother. And he said, you are right. And he wrote her name on the, on the list. And she said, listen, I know I will survive, but please save my husband. So he erased her name and put our father's name on the list. And our father 
was sent to Oscar Schindler's camp in Czechoslovakia, and our mom was sent to Auschwitz. You know, it's even hard for me to talk about it because they knew each other for such a short time and she gave like her place for him. Like she didn't know if she will survive, but she had the feeling she will. And you know, something very interesting that our parents were telling us about the Holocaust every day, but they didn't tell us how they saved people. This we found out later. And our mom didn't tell our father that she's the one who saved him. Only 50 years later, by coincidence, she blurbed it and she told him. And he looked at her and he said, he was shocked. How come you didn't tell me? I really felt that I don't belong there. So she said to him, because I didn't want you to feel that you owe me anything because I did it from love. And this is exact all the time, how they were always. The love between them was unbelievable. And in Auschwitz, she saved a lot of people. And uh, this is, this is uh, uh, the picture like uh, of the wedding. So it's our mom, our father, and uh, our mother's, our father's mother. It's even hard for me to say grandma because we, we never had a grandma or a grandfather. Everyone was murdered. In our father family, in our mom family, our parents were alone. And Slila and Adasa took her. We were alone in Israel. And after our mom passed away, we found something in the in the closet. And Adasa takes it out and says to me, Slila, look, mom wrote diaries. And we had no idea. And in the diaries, she wrote how she saved people with names and everything. And we gave it for translation. And we said, this book is so important because first of all, she saved so many people and she writes about it. She also wrote how she saved our father. And also such an optimistic woman. She always saw everything pink, like our father always. They were always encouraging people, helping people. And this is our mom's book. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called In the Name of God. And uh, now we want to show you a short scene from uh, Schindler's List. It's metal polisher. So the man who is writing is our father, he's forging paper. This is our mother who is doing the manicure. Like the actress, of course, who is portraying her. This is the commandant, Amon Get. Although I am not a rabbi, in these circumstances, I pray to the Almighty that he will forgive me if I intone the blessings.
This is from the end of the movie. And here you see our parents. This is our mom putting a stone on Oscar Schindler's grave. Oh, now after the war, our father found our mom in a miraculous way and they returned to Krakow. When they came to Krakow, for two reasons. One, they wanted to look for a family which they didn't find. And second, our father wanted to finish his studies in university. And he told our mom like this, you know, our first wedding was without a rabbi, without any mayonnaise salad or, or any uh, food. So you know what, let's get married again with a rabbi, with food, with music. And here you see the wedding picture from 1946. But they wanted to have a picture also from the first wedding, but of course there was uh, no cameras in the, in the camp. So what did he do? He painted stripes on the picture and now you see both weddings. Now, uh, when Oscar Schindler used to come to Israel, uh, of course, we were always there, our parents were always there. Uh, all the buses used to uh, go out from Abima here beside us from, uh, from, we are sitting now in the museum actually, and uh, we had a very close connection to Oscar Schindler because uh, he loved our father very much. And uh, he always, when he came, he said, where is my music? Where is my music? Where is my son? And uh, here is, you see Oscar Schindler at the airport. And this is our mother giving him a box of chocolates. Uh, here he used to come to exhibitions that uh, uh, our father and Adassa opened. Uh, so here is in, in one of the exhibitions, this is Adassa and the, our father was the photographer always. So he is uh, not in the pictures and he treated us like his granddaughters. Here is in his funeral, you see here is our father always with the camera. He was always behind the camera. Here is uh, our parents, our father, our mom, Steven Spielberg, the actor who portrayed our father and she portrayed our mom. Uh, last year, our father and our mother got a special award of Jews who saved Jews from the Bnei Brit International. And here you see, this is the award that our father got. And this is the award that our mom got. Uh, our father didn't only save by forging documents. He saved by many other ways. For example, he made playing cards. When he saw that someone wanted to commit suicide, he came to him and said, tell me, why do you want to commit suicide? you'll see life will continue. And he showed him the card. And you see here is a wedding. He said, you'll get married one day or you are going to have a family or you're going to have a baby. And he gave them hope that life will continue. And we met some people and they said, he gave us hope. He encouraged us to keep on going, not to be depressed. He also in Ghetto Krakow wrote a gada for Passover and like everything uh, like the Agada, but what's happening to them in the ghetto. And uh, we read it in the, in the Lel Seder every year. And uh, it's also has a lot of humor in it. Hard to believe, but it has humor. What else did he do? He wrote poems, but he didn't have paper. 
So he collected the cigarette buds that the German threw and he wrote poems on those cigarette buds. And he wrote a book with a hundred uh, and some poems and 11 paintings with a tiny, tiny hand, right? Today you need a, a magnifying glass in order to be able to read it. And he hid it in, his, uh, in his, the case that he had. That's why we have it. And uh, we decided that this book has to be translated and has, because it has so much, how will I say, like inspiration, like he writes about its love poems and uh, humoristic poems and hope. And like he was reading it to his friends and they said he, he kept them alive. So, uh, here you see the painting and some of, and here is some of the paintings from the book and his handwrite. And one, one poem, I want to translate it to you. Sorry, to read it to you. Actually, we would like to uh, uh, translate the whole book, but it's very difficult because you have to know, you have to be a poet in uh, English and a poet in Polish to understand because he wrote it in rhymes and uh, in a very, very uh, special uh, language. So the name of the poem is a prayer. Every day in my morning prayer, I thank you God for so generously giving me life as hard as steel, as heavy as lead that you will that you will me to endless, endlessly carry the load of plants still blooming, futile efforts of dreams doomed to be remembered, but no more, not even worthy of mention. Be blessed, my Lord, that you ignited in me an unyielding strength which keeps me searching all over the earth in pursuit of happiness, the happiness, happiness which keeps evading me, the happiness I will never find, that each fall is a call to strive for the finish line, as always unreachable, for the anticipation, for having me always searching. Be blessed my Lord. You know, it's very hard for me even to talk because I can't even imagine him sitting in the camp, what he's going through and he's thanking God for every minute. This is another painting. And, and what, look what we did. We, we built a case that resembles our father's case that he had in the, in the Holocaust with all his uh, works of art. Uh, you, you can open it. And when you open it, you see inside, uh, we put our mother's diaries, which we translated into a, uh, Hebrew and our father's poem book, which we also translated. And uh, underneath the two books, we hid exact copy of the tiny book, which our father wrote in the camp. The name is the Shviat Iyad, the world and I. And the reason we he did because we wanted the reader to understand how our father wrote it inside the camp. And uh, all the books and everything, of course, uh, you can buy uh, only here in the museum or we can even uh, through our uh, website, we can uh, ship it to you. And uh, here we brought you some of his paintings, which he painted there. Uh, here he painted like a chess game. And he said that uh, the Holocaust was like a chess game 
one bad move and it was checkmate. Now, if you look clearly, it's, ve it's very hard to uh, see at the beginning, but you can see that there are no white squares. So it means the game, just the blacks are playing. And the black are representing the, the, the Germans and the white are very far away. Like usually we ask, but here we can't ask you, who do you think it represent? So it represent the world. The world was standing aside and did absolutely nothing. You know, even today in Israel, we have so many problems and the world doesn't help us. So this painting is like even right today. Here is the men's camp and the, it's a painting how they were dividing the bread and uh, the bread was very hard to divide because they, uh, my, our father wrote in his book, they, the Germans baked it in such a shape that we weren't able to divide it between us evenly. But we managed, and there is a whole story behind this, be, behind this uh, painting. Here he said, he painted that the entrance was through the gate and the only exit was through the chimney. Here is the world as if wanted to help, if. They didn't have eyes, they didn't have ears, they didn't have mouth. And this is our father. Uh, it's uh, a, the, how he's uh, drinking the, meat, the soup and they, it becomes part of his uh, clothes. And, and, and this is his number here. Here our father was punished and he got 50 lashes. And uh, usually many people died after those lashes because uh, it was horrible. And after they finished beating him up, his friends took him to his uh, uh, bank and uh, they put him on, uh, on, his, on the bed there. And he's all bleeding and, and horrible condition. And he's lying there and he started laughing. And they asked him, how come you are laughing after they beat you up so badly? He said, listen, I made a mistake in one word, but I don't know German. Do you know how many mistakes I made? So if they beat me up for one word, so I have to be happy, so I'm happy. Here he said that the, the Jews were uh, without any identity, everyone was bald and striped uniform, but when they burnt them, the, uh, their souls went up to heaven in the shape of Hebrew letters. And this also, he made the same painting about Auschwitz, that the entrance was through the gate and the only exit was through the chimney. Here we brought you some pictures uh, that our father hid in his bag. This is our grandma when she was young. Uh, this is a, a, our father, his mother, his father. They were all murdered. His younger brother, Iju, that they killed. And his a middle, I say middle brother that uh, he survived. And our father found him uh, later on. Those are our parents after the war, always laughing, always happy. You know, our, we lived in a house that were full of jokes. Our father was always telling jokes. Every day he came home with a new joke and our father was laughing and, and we were laughing. And this was the atmosphere at home. On one hand, they were telling the, about the Holocaust. And on the other hand, they were, they were making us laugh all the time. This is another book he wrote, uh, stories, uh, humoristic stories. 
This is the book about the Hebrew language that he wrote. It's called Brit Mila, but actually what he meant was a covenant with the Hebrew language. He found the humor and the logic in the Hebrew language. And he's the only artist who painted the Hebrew language. Uh, we, we brought you just a few paintings to show you. Like when he came to Israel, he didn't know any Hebrew and he went to buy bread and he saw that the word bread is lechem, has exactly the same letters like lacham. Lacham is fighting in past tense, like fought. He said, wait a minute, I know how much I had to fight for my bread. Bread and fighting? What an interesting language. And he started teaching himself Hebrew by himself. Here you see a woman who has a necklace of bullets and in her hand, she has a lipstick in the shape of a bullet. In Hebrew weapons, you say neshek. And, and, a, and a kiss, you say neshika. He said, I wish that all the weapons will turn into a, like all the neshek will turn into a neshika. It's the same root word. Here is a symbol of peace and love. Our father said, if the hand is closed like this, this is war, this is violence, but exactly the same hand open, this is uh, peace. But for peace, you need the heart, right? So he added the heart and the dove. Here is, star, is a star of David and everything about Israel is here. It's a modern star of David. This is a kibbutz, ocean, fish, cactus, uh, citrus fruit, and even the sun is shish kebab. It's so warm here, you can cook outside. Uh, the sun loves Israel. The sun is drawing the star of David with a thermometer. Uh, here we have a riddle, which, but we cannot hear your answers. A, a musician is playing with a saw. And a so in Hebrew, you say masor. And how did he call this painting? He called it mangina masortit, which means traditional music. And masoret, ma, masor is the same root letters as masoret. Masoret is tradition. So our father said, all days are trying to cut our tradition, but we are continuing. And it should be a messer, message is message, a message from generation to generation. Uh, like Adasa told you in the beginning, our father loved to make uh, uh, days of uh, photos. He was also a photographer. Here you see all of us. Uh, and of course, our father directed the whole picture. And this is our father when he came to Israel in uh, 1950. Here is our father working on the table that he worked in the ghetto and he found it when he came back to Krakow, he found it in the ghetto area and he worked on it all his life and we have it in our museum till today. This is our father in the uh, museum, then it was his studio. This is uh, our parents in 1956. When Tzlila was born. <laughs> yeah, so now you are telling my age. Yeah. <laughs> and now we have a surprise for you. In 2014, uh, it was our parents 70th uh, wedding anniversary. And Adassa's son, decided to get married in the concentration camp because today it's a park. And according to our father's map, we know exactly where our parents got married and he got, it was a symbolic wedding, but this is the wedding. And the chupa we made with our father's painting, soon we'll show you the painting. So this is Adasa San Boaz and his wife Or. And can you imagine we made it there? Here, and we were, uh, he was reading here the Ketubah and Adasa and me. 
And this is the painting that was on the chupa. And uh, this is our mom who was always, always laughing. And she had such a laugh. If you hear her laugh, you laugh too. You just couldn't, uh, it was so contagious. Uh, this is our uh, 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 the website and the Facebook. Uh, we are Joseph Bauhaus. And uh, we just want to share with you that uh, we are right now under a lot of problems because um, this museum that was our father's studio, and it's a very, very important museum because it's the only museum in the world that uh, shows, first of all, about the Holocaust and the first, uh, and the smallest movie theater in the world. And our father was the first animator in Israel. And it's the only museum in the world about the Hebrew language and graphic and, uh, and art and, uh, and fonts and calligraphy and, and everything in humor. And you don't have such a museum, not in Israel and not in the world. And because we are very, very small museum, we're only 53 square meters, we don't have any support from no one, not from the government, not from the, the, the municipality, from no one. And uh, we are under a lot of trouble right now because first of all, uh, they want uh, to tear down this building and it's not, uh, it doesn't belong to us, the place. We pay rent, very, very high rent and uh, rent and all the additional things around it, it we pay about 12,000 shekels, Israeli shekels a month. And especially now during the Corona, it, we almost closed the place, but uh, many good people helped us. Uh, and uh, right now we never ask for donations. And now we started asking for donations and, uh, or, and we are a nonprofit organization also. And also, um, a, and another big problem is that they are going to tear down the building. And because it doesn't belong to us, they told us already that uh, we won't stay here. And we don't have any money to move. We don't have any money to buy a new place. And actually, we are going through a very difficult time right now because we don't know what will happen and we are under a lot of stress. And it's hard for us to ask, but we ask for donations to help us save the museum. And if you know anyone who can help us, this will be fantastic. You can buy, a, you can order the books, you can order the, the lithographs. Uh, we have even shirts with oh, all our- father signed. Uh, yeah, also our father signed on the lithographs. Uh, some are signed, some are not. And we also have uh, shirts that uh, with the paintings. So uh, we want to thank you so much and uh, for sitting and listening. And if you have any questions, of course, we are here. We'll be happy to answer. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Slilat and, and Hadassah for that amazing presentation. Uh, I think a lot of people have been so inspired just listening to this presentation and the way you delivered it. So thank you very much for that. The one question is the love story of your parents is truly inspiring. However, they were separated during the war because they were sent to different camps. But after the war, your father managed to find your mother and they reunited. Can you please tell us about the miracles of that reunion. Uh, do we have time? Can we tell? Yes, we do. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, because it's quite a long story. So maybe I'll shorten it. Mm -hmm. So uh, our father, after the war, immediately he, he moved to, he, somehow he got to Krakow and he heard that uh, our mom was in a hospital in a, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia because um, when the war ended, she found a, a horse and a wagon 
and they uh, and she took five more uh, friends and they were galloping towards Krakow. And on the way, they had an accident and they were and they fell and they were badly injured in and they were lying in a hospital uh, in a city called um, Freudenthal. And when our father heard it, so immediately he wanted to find her and he was still in his striped uniform. So he went uh, to the border between Czechoslovakia and Poland and he asked, <clears throat> How do I get to Freudenthal? And they told him to take a train from the border to a place called the Shvinov, a city, and there to change trains. And he went on the train and he was very tired and he was very weak and he fell asleep. And when he woke up, he asked someone, where is Shvinov? They told him, Shvinov, Phew! you passed it already. He said, what shall I do? They said, get off the next station and uh, take another uh, train going back. So he uh, wanted to take uh, the train that is going back and they told him, ah, you missed it, it already left. He said, what shall I do? So wait, another uh, freight train is going to come by and uh, go on it. And he said, okay. And uh, and he went, and then all of a sudden the train stopped. And uh, he said, uh, they, they told him to get off and wait in the station. And, and they didn't know what happened. They said, what happened? And they said the previous train, the one he missed, went over a bridge and the bridge collapsed. All the people got killed and the, uh, wait here till the bus will take you through a bridge to a different uh, uh, through a different bridge. And they were sitting and waiting and all of a sudden the Czech woman looked at him and saw him in a striped uniform and in those days the Nazis got dressed as the uh, Jews and were escaping. So she looked at our father and said, Nazi, Nazi at our father and our, our father said, I'm not a Nazi, I was in the concentration camp, I'm Jewish. He said, ah, sure, 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 tell it to the police. And she dragged him to the police station and the policeman asked him, why are you in a striped uniform? And he said, listen, I don't have much time, please let me go, I don't want to miss the bus because my wife is in a hospital in Freudenthal and I want uh, to see her because they told me she's badly injured. He said, you know, it's very interesting because the same case happened here. Also some women wear a horse and a buggy and they fell and they are badly injured here in the hospital. So our father said, you know, maybe they're from the same concentration camp. Maybe they know anything about my wife. Maybe I can go and see them. So he sent him with another policeman. Of course, he didn't believe him with handcuffs and they were walking toward the uh, hospital when they came close to the hospital. So our father whistled like to himself. <whistles> and our mom heard it. She was there and she said to her friends, I guess I'm in heaven because I hear my husband. And they told her, no, we hear him too. And then they brought him up. And our father, like he wrote in his book, the re reunion, I have no words to describe it. And that's how they met. Miracles. Mm. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's very heartwarming. Thank you for that, that story. Um, and then Aubrey is asking, um, you mentioned that the, the museum is going through some difficulties. Yeah. How, can we do, how can we donate towards the rescue of the museum? Uh, on our Facebook, the website, sorry, uh, www.josephbau.com, you have the uh, donate button. And uh, there you can donate, it's through PayPal. Yeah, 
Okay. So, so there you have a, a, it's on the front page, on the home page of the website. All right. Okay. We'll also share that link as well okay. to people. You. And then another question that's coming from Larry Pfeiffer, and he's asking, what is the connection between the very inspiring story of Joseph and Rebecca Bau and the Bolshevik Rosa Luxemburg? Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so maybe we'll 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 come back to that question, and then there's another one: the friendship between your father and Oscar Schindler uh, remained strong until Schindler's death in 1974. Yeah. On one of his visits, there's a story that on one on one of his visits to Israel, um, Slila was five years old. Right. And Schindler told, told you that I am your grandfather. Um, and at the time you didn't understand what that meant because you knew who your grandparents were. Um, can, you, can you tell us about this relationship between your father and, and Oscar Schindler and you yourselves as well with Oscar yeah. Schindler? Yeah, uh, just before that, I just want to say uh, that uh, before uh, uh, our parents got the award of Jews or Save Jews. So there are not many people, there are hardly any people that uh, are alive today that our father saved. So, and we needed the, uh, you know, uh, docu um, witnesses. And then someone told us that he was in a lecture somewhere and he heard a, a judge that uh, his name is Hanan Meltzer, who is in the Supreme Court and uh, that he was talking about our father and we invited us to the Supreme Court and he told us that our father was like the right hand of Oscar Schindler. He uh, forged all the documents for him that he needed for food, for everything he needed. And when the war, and, and actually helped him save the 1200 Jews and uh, just before ended, the commandant of the camp, his name was Leipold, he got already a, a, a call from uh, um, no, Berlin to uh, kill all the Jews. And Oscar Schindler heard it. So he told our father, you know, I want you to forge a telegram as if it's from Berlin. I will sit with, the Leipold in the room, when I put down my hat like this on the table, you run in and said this telegram has just come to uh, the commandant and, uh, and give it to him. But uh, he didn't buy it, like, like he didn't believe the commandant and he still wanted to kill everyone. And then uh, on the next day, our father saw the dark the Jews are digging a huge hole and he asked someone what's going on here. And yet they understood that the, the commandant wants to kill all of them. So Schindler came to our father with a basket and inside was a bottle of, uh, of wine or whatever. And he told our father like this, uh, you know how to say it. Like, like he said to him, he was talking to him Czech, but it was like Polish. He pointed up with his head like this, and Leipold, the commandant, was sitting upstairs, and he said to him, like, give him this urine. But our father understood, and he gave, went to him and gave him the bottle of wine and told him, Herr Schindler does hat geschenkt. Like, uh, Mr. Schindler sent it to you. And he took the bottle and drank it, blah, 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 like that, and uh, lost his conscious. Uh, Oscar Schindler put the something. And then he didn't have time to kill all the Jews and then the war ended. And uh, so our father was like helping Schindler in all the time. And then uh, he even hung the, the flag when the, the war was uh, over. So uh, 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 the judge also told us a lot of things how our father helped uh, Oscar Schindler. And uh, you asked me about uh, Oscar Schindler and us. 
So when I was five years old, uh, I didn't have any, we didn't have any grandparents, like we said. And uh, we were jealous of all, all the kids that had grandparents. And one day when Oscar Schindler came to Israel, our parents took us to meet him. And on the way they told him who he was, how he saved 1200 Jews and, and, uh, and we came to the hotel to see him. He was a very tall man, very handsome. And I remember he picked me up in his arms. I was only five. And he told me, I'm your grandfather because I saved your father. And I remember looking at him and thinking, oh my God, not only did I have a grandfather, but I have such a handsome grandfather and such a hero grandfather. And we were always so proud of him. And he called us our granddaughters and we called him our grandfather. Mm. That's, a, that's a sweet story. Uh, thank you. And then one last question, but before I ask it, my colleague Danny has actually posted in the chat, he's posted the link um, that will take people to your, a platform where they can donate um, to the museum. So I would encourage people to go to the chat and look at that link. But the last question that was sent to me is that your father dreamed, your father dreamt of making animated films. Right. And, at that, and at that time, there was very little awareness of cartooning in Israel. And in fact, his brother wanted him to come to New York to work as an animator, but your father chose to stay in Israel and he ended up building Israel's first animation studio. Right. Um, yes, can you tell us more about this, this studio and his passion for, for this kind of work? Like when my, our parents came to Israel, they were in the Ma'abara. Ma'abara is like a transit camp. And uh, our father told our mom, you know, I want to build a studio for animation. And she said to him, oh, I guess the sun struck your head. We don't have any money for food. You're talking about animations. He says, mom, don't worry. You know that I built everything by myself. And when he came here to this studio in 1960, like I showed you in the pictures before, he found the leg from an x-ray machine and all kinds of parts. And he built the first, the, a machine to make animation. So he also wrote the script, he also painted. You know how much uh, patience you need for that? Because to make animation movie, every second it's 24 paintings. And he made the animation. Everything movie. one man after he developed it and he painted it and he filmed it, he wrote everything one man. And 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 he and he screened it here and the and all many many uh, things that were uh, in the movies uh, commercials that were in the animation he did it, but no one knew that he was the animator. He was a secret man who lived a double life. And our museum is like a, a, a secret museum because here uh, he, was a, he lived a double life in Israel and he lived a double life in the Holocaust. Mm. Um, Les, Dr. Glassman, uh, is, there any, is there anything you would like to say? Yes, I actually would. I just want to thank you both Slina and Hadassah for the most incredible, heartwarming and phenomenal presentation. And you know, may your parents' memory, Rebecca and Joseph, may just be for an eternal blessing. Because oh. they just, there's no words, really, there are no words. Your story is so, it's so touching, it's so emotional and you presented it to the other daughters. It's so real and we are so grateful to you. And we are so grateful also I just want to thank the Holocaust and Genocide Center for, you know, for hosting this event, uh, and also our partners with Telfed mm -hmm. and its alumni, but especially the Holocaust and Genocide Center for all the incredible work that you put together to make tonight a reality. But uh, I've been to the museum, the Bau Museum, and um, I would just recommend it for everybody because it is something, it's an experience. You, you'll never see anything like this. Not only is it the smallest, I think Guinness, the Guinness World Records have got it as the smallest museum in the world, 
but there is so much. Every single square meter of the museum tells a story and it's all real, it's all, it's all the original. So uh, we really want to do everything in our power to help you, Tzlil and Adessa. And we thank you so much for this incredible presentation that you gave tonight. And thank you all for making this really a reality. And I want to and thank everybody Les, for joining. Les, we want to thank you also for introducing yeah. us to, uh, to Tali, which she, she was here also a few years ago, and to Larry Pfeffer that introduced us to you. And uh, we want to thank everyone also. And, uh, and uh, we will be very happy for uh, any help you can uh, give us. Thank you so much, really. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I just want to mention we have a very special guest as well, Professor Asha Matthias, who's all the way from, uh, he was born in Volos in Greece. Prof, if you could just mention a word, he's a survivor, he was born in Volos during the Shoah in Greece, and he's joined us tonight. He's a very close and dear friend. Thank if you could just mention one or two words, Prof. Thank you. My, my mother, is, uh, uh, until her death, 96 years old, uh, she was four years ago, she passed, uh, is, was Sephardi from Salonika, the famous uh, city of Salonika. My father was uh, a Romagnot, Greek speaker, uh, and they met, they fell in love, and in spite of the fact that it was in occupied Greece, they went ahead with uh, marriage and, uh, in 1942. And December 3rd, 1943, uh, while we were hiding in the mountains, uh, I was uh, born. And um, uh, the Germans were coming to uh, comb the uh, countryside. Uh, and some young Jewish families were betrayed by the cries of their own kids. Years later, uh, and they were even stifled, some of them with uh, pillows, and to only to find them dead after the, um, the emergency. Years later, my mother would say, Asher, you are our savior. I said, what are you talking about, mom? I was a baby. Yes, but you were a quiet baby. And even so, a German patrol discovered us during daylight hours. My father was not around. He was uh, supporting the resistance. So anything could have happened to us except that the head of patrol looked down at the makeshift uh, crib and smiled and said, I left a baby like this in Hamburg. The next word was rouse, never to bother us again. It was a Hanukkah miracle. So uh, uh, eventually we came to America because we also had earthquakes and America came to our rescue for the first time uh, since the war, they said, we did not do enough to support um, Jews during the Holocaust. Come, either come to America or we will help you rebuild your lives in Greece. No way. Let's come to America. And on, December, on January 30th, 1956, I celebrate a second birthday coming to America. I was 12 years old in the, then. The rest is beautiful history. I gave you the link to read about it. Um, and it's just an inspiration. There are many um, topics and stories of survival. Everyone is unique, but uh, it's part of the, uh, the belief in hope and, and having confidence to go on. And you have provided that a plenty and I congratulate you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Les, for this opportunity. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, you Professor so much. Asha. Um, Slila and, and, and Hadassah, yeah, any last words before we close? <laughs> this is, we are in terrible time. What Slila and I, we keep the place alone. And uh, we don't know what will be because uh, the minute that they going to build, they said we need to leave and we don't have money even to another place. Yeah. So we are, so we, we want to thank you so much. 
and we are so excited very much. to meet all of you and please stay in touch and uh, we'll be very happy to see you in our museum and I'll tell you one more thing that we are also a mobile museum and we have exhibitions all over the world. Our father's paintings were exhibited in many big museums, in the, also in the UN uh, building in uh, New York, in the uh, Oscar Schindler's uh, Museum in Krakow, in, uh, a mu in the museum in Moscow, in many places. And we will be happy uh, in New York. And we have uh, our paintings are now in storage in New York. We can uh, ship them anywhere in the world and have the exhibit, of course, when the I just have an go. idea, by the way. Uh, I, I'm the president of B'nai B'rith in the five towns here in uh, 10 minutes away from Kennedy Airport. And we publish a, a bulletin, a monthly bulletin. Anything you wish us to promote, including your fundraiser, we'd be delighted to, uh, to include. This, oh. is what, this is the most recent one that went out this, uh, this July about the, uh, the Farhud in the 80th anniversary of the Farhud in, in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, uh, anything you wish, uh, you know, anything that uh, can elevate uh, the discussion and educate and inform our, our uh, people here, it would be most delighted. I gave you my address, Asher J. Matt at AOL. And you're welcome to contact me, please. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Wow, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I'm about, to bring people together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Lowell. Mm -hmm. I know Lowell is watching also from the uh, Root and Branch. Thank you. Um, thank you thank very you. much, Slida, and thank you very thank much, you Hadassah, for... for for, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us and for staying throughout this presentation and for your questions and comments. I would advise you to look at the chat, to look at the websites and the links that have been posted there that will enable you to continue to follow the work that we do so that you can keep up with the, the future webinars, but also to support um, the, the museum um, and also to support the work that uh, Slila and Hadassah are doing in their museum. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, goodbye, uh, good thank afternoon, you. good evening. We love thank you, me. love you. Thank you yes. very much for everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Toda. Thank you, Slila and Hadassah. Thank you from Telfed. Toda. Toda, toda. Toda. Thank you to Les. Wow. Yes, thank you, Les. Thank, thank you, Dr. Glassman.